Jeff did exhibit an interest in the way the bones clanked as he picked them up and put them back into the metal pail. There definitely were warning signs that I missed. He roamed around the country roads where we lived and gathered on his bike with big plastic bags the remains of various animals. And he kept these animals and um, felt them, uh, explored them, their insides. He was extremely secretive and uh, devious. Now what you just got a glimpse of is all coming up, but first I want to welcome two men who say they were victims of Jeffrey Dahmer. The difference is they survived. Preston Davis and Billy Capshaw. Gentlemen, it's so good to meet you, and uh, I mean that at two levels. It, it's good to meet you, and it's good that you're still here and alive and able to be met, because you now know a, a lot more about this uh, individual you were dealing with and realize you could easily have been numbers 18 and 19. That's hard to think about. Yes, sir. It's real hard to think about. And it almost happened. You know, uh, I went to the military when I was uh, 17 years old and left home from a place in Arkansas, a little small town. And uh, moving forward, I got to Germany and there was a jolly guy who, who introduces me to my next roommate, and it was Jeff Dahmer. Uh, that was the first day I was there. Okay, so when you're first there, he yes. says, you're going to have a roommate. This is him. This is, this is Jeff Dahmer. This is Jeff and Dahmer. Preston, how did, how did you meet I, Jeff? Um, I actually met Jeff. I was in Germany from 1977 to 1980. I had about eight months left in country. And my sergeant asked me to train the new gentleman, which was Jeffrey Dahmer. And that was July of 79. He told me that he would promote me to sergeant. And so we were out on a field exercise in Belgium. And I was to train him to be a medic. And the last few days of our exercise, our vehicle broke down. And during that time, I was drugged and raped by Jeffrey. At that time, I had no recollection of it. The following month, we were at a Thanksgiving dinner. And I had actually got into an altercation with Jeff, put him out into a blizzard, he came back with blood on his hands, didn't know where he'd been, what he'd done. Now, the only way I found that out was I was on a serial killer website, and I found out I was in a book called The Shrine of Jeffrey Dahmer, which was written by Brian Masters, and it mentioned me by name. It described the incident, and that kind of blew me away. At that point, I still really hadn't put it all together. And then when I left, this gentleman here replaced me and I was contacted in 2012 to do a film on men-on-men -on -men rape in the military called Justice Denied. Um, and so that's when I met Billy, and we went to Albuquerque, and we were in that film. And then it just started to, to take off. You know, God started revealing little bits and pieces. I went through my records. I realized I had all kind of rectal issues throughout my career. And um, that's basically how we met. And we've been doing this ever since. What was your first impression of... Jeffrey was a very uh, obnoxious individual. He was very uh, different. And when I say that, I mean, you know, the average uh, gentleman at 17 or 18 would talk about when we played football or basketball in high school, or I dated this girl, I dated that girl. That was never discussed. He was just a very aloof type individual, smart, but just different. He raped me, drugged me, and I'd have to, uh, the jumped out a window, two-story window, broke my pelvis and my hip. Okay, now this was the second night. I was there, yes, yes that sir. That you were there. Yes, sir. And you, you said he, he drugged you and raped you. Yes. And he also beat you. Yes, he beat me so hard that I, I, I of course, yelled. But he, if I yelled, he would hit me harder to stop the yelling, I just gave up. I just gave up, you know? And I cannot, for the sake of me, understand why anyone would want to glamorize that guy at all. That's sick. You know, it's it has to stop. Dr. Phil, I believe the military knew. I spent, I a, a, I spent a many a night 
laying in my house, and I'm like, how could they not know? Because I was in the military. He, he had a very short tent. I wasn't in almost 10 years. And so, you know, I knew the structure on how it went. You make formation, which is where you're accounted for, where we have all the cooks, whatever. And then you run, you shower, and then you go to your particular job area. This man never made formation. Jeff made formation when I was there. How in the heck could they not know that this man was being tortured? I wrestled with that, and I finally came to the conclusion that everything in this spiritual realm or in the flesh is not for me to know. Something God knows all. It's not for me to know because I would have lost my mind trying to figure out how in the hell did the military. They had to know. They did know. They had to I have know. A, I, I have a, a letter that was written to me about 10 years ago from a, a warrant officer. He was under investigation for the death of a man named Hans. He was the last one seen with Hans. He who? Uh, Jeff. Jeff. Jeff was under the investigation, I'm sorry, uh, for the murder of a man named Hans. Yeah, they knew. You watched a little bit of, this, yeah. of the series. What was your reaction? I threw up. I threw up, made me sick to think that someone would take advantage of a, a community, a black community, African-American community, LGBTQ community. All these people that I've been fighting for since I've got hurt, all these people, that, and, and then some guy comes in, and I have a better choice of words I can't use on TV, comes in and undermines everything that these people stand for. I think he re-victimized them, re-traumatized them, shamed them, you, the whole gamut. They call me, you know? This lady and this guy from Netflix call me. I am not doing anything for them like that. And I said, if it's to glamorize them, I'm hanging up right now. And she started to try to explain to me what they were doing. And, and I, I, got, I got off the phone, I'm not doing it. Have you watched any of it? Yes, I, uh, I did watch it. Um, I felt it was over the top. Um, they didn't need to present it the way that they did. I think it was insensitive for the way it was done. Um, the majority of people uh, know the story, at least the, the civilian part of it. I think they glamorized it. But I, on the other token, um, I felt that overall it needed to be told because there are people like myself and, and people in the audience that serial killers are normal. They look normal, they talk normal, they act normal, and so the public needs to be aware that there are people walking amongst us that are potential killers. What's your reaction to hearing him speak and, and say those things, knowing that he had you incapacitated, drugged, you. and, and had his hands on you? I was, um, I really suffered once I realized what happened to me, uh, survivor's guilt. Um, I basically suppressed my feelings with drugs and alcohol for a while. It's a, a miracle that I'm still married. But I blame myself for what happened to Billy because I didn't remember. And I remember when, when I met Billy and Billy had told my wife what happened and my wife asked Billy, how could he not remember? 30 years, Dr. Phil, I did not have any inkling what happened to me. When he got caught, I didn't realize what happened to me. I was actually watching a show on serial killers in 1992 uh, in Virginia. And what cued me was they showed the patch. We had an eight on our uh, un uniform. And at that point, I still didn't realize I had been raped, but I realized that I had been stationed with him. And so it was years later that I realized what had happened to me. And it just, it just kind of blew me away, you know. Well, Preston, he says that he didn't commit any crimes out of hate, but you said you sensed racism and, and hate spewing out of him. Yes. Uh, I was not afraid of Jeff. I actually knocked Jeff out because he urinated in my boots, and they moved him out of my room. And that, that was early on when I met him in probably July or August of 79. Mm -hmm. So he was definitely a racist. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not for me to say, you know, I'm not going to play the race card and say he was, you know, was white privileged. But that's something, Billy. That is, it was white privilege. Yeah, I, I agree the, with that. The, as well, the, the charisma, the, the, the good looking guy from Wisconsin, and he played all these people.
And he's lying in that interview. He's lying. He was a practice liar, practice manipulator, practiced everything. How can you get like that that young? He would rape and beat you continuously all the time. How many times a week? I, I wasn't counting, sir, but I will tell you it was more than five. It was more than, it depended on how much he drank. I actually stole his money out of his wall locker while I was doing that. I found ketamine bottles. I found, I was a medic as well at 17 years old. I found ketamine. I found lorazepam or Ativan. He kept you injured. He broke your he hand. Broke he broke my your hip. foot. Yes. Uh, he stabbed you. He stabbed me. I think we counted 30 times. And this actually is a fingerprint right here. Mm -hmm, I see that. Grab it here and choke. He stabbed you 30 times. He said that he was going to take my prostate out. I was tied up at the time. He had given me, given me something IV, which as medics, we had, uh, you know, access to all that stuff. You're in the military. In you the had military, a rape kit done. You would never think that this would happen. You told a nurse you had a rape kit done. Right. What happened? She threw it away. And Why? I communicate with this nurse all the time. She's in a VA health care. It's a senior or a uh, VA. Uh, she's been in there since 1984 home. or 5. Yeah. Institutionalized. Institutionalized. Yeah. So somehow You're, or another, she threw it away. These guys need to understand. Ryan Murphy and all these people who developed this stuff need to understand that's what happens. I'm lucky I didn't kill myself. I attempted suicide three times. I was going to kill him, okay? I wanted to kill him. Trust me. Rita Isbell, the sister of Errol Lindsay, joins us now remotely. She says watching portions of Monster on Netflix left her feeling like she was reliving her worst nightmare. Uh, Rita, it's an honor to meet you. Same here. I'm just, woo, listening to the two gentlemen. It just blew my mind. That lets me know that I was right the whole time when I was in front of him, Dr. Phil. I felt it. You felt the presence of evil when you were with I him. I felt it. I felt it. Yeah. I had no idea. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's okay. Just talk through the tears. What What did you feel like? What did you feel a presence when you looked him in the eye? Don't always face to face with Satan himself. I feel so bad for the two gentlemen. I really feel bad for you. I do. That's why I'm crying right now. I'm crying for them. When you think about this, do you think about Jeffrey Dahmer or do you think about what your brother went through? What is it that haunts you the most? Well, 31 years ago, the time has passed, so I was kind of dealing with it. But since the movie came out, and the way he told the movie and showed the movie and lied about him contacting us. He didn't contact none of us. He had his way here in Milwaukee. And Jeffrey Dahmer owned Milwaukee. He robbed you of your brother, and he robbed your brother of this whole life he had stretching ahead of him. And um, d describe your brother growing up. I mean, this is, this is a young man that you, you love dearly. Yes, he was more like my son than my brother. Um, very outgoing, very strong personality. He was a big brother to my children. Um, he loved sports. He loved to eat. He tried to cook. There's not a whole lot you can tell because he was just, he was just, what, 34 days uh, being 19. Mm. His birthday was March 3rd. He left home April 7th. Do you have a story or a question for me? Click the link in the description and tell me what in the world is going on.